PhD history teacher helping a group of English schoolboys to get into Oxford or Cambridge. And at one point, the, the, one of the boys gets very frustrated with history. And he says, but sir, history is just one fucking thing after another. <laughs> Which is a great line. <laughs> but that's not quite right. Because actually, history is one fucking disaster after another. And it feels that way, doesn't it? You, you've got COVID-19, the biggest pandemic that we can remember. And then you turn on the television and Germany is underwater. And then you change channel and Kabul is falling to the Taliban. And my mother, who's 84, says, oh, it's just one disaster after another. <laughs> and it, in a way it is. I mean, history is like that because historians are drawn towards disaster. What was the first book I ever wrote? It was a book about the biggest monetary disaster in history the German hyperinflation after the First World War. And I used to hang out with German historians, which is a masochistic mm. way of spending your time. <laughs> Fun, they do not do. Because they study disasters all the time. I mean, German history was die deutsche Katastrophe. That's what Meineke called. But Doom says, Relax, the, the end of the world is really quite a long way away. It's just disasters of varying sizes and forms that we have to deal with. And we need to think rationally about disasters in order to deal with them well. What was lacking last year, certainly in the United States, and in, I think, many European countries, was any sense of perspective. Was it just the seasonal flu, or was it the Black Death? In reality, COVID-19 was somewhere in between. We struggled to understand what was happening, I think mainly because of a lack of historical perspective. So the idea of this book is to put disasters in history into some perspective and to make sense of the paradox that we get richer, we get safer, we live longer, our living stands are higher on average than at any time in the past. That Steve Pinker is right when he says in Enlightenment Now, things are getting better. Why is the news always about the disasters? This was my old friend Steve Pinker's complaint uh, ever since we were colleagues at Harvard. Steve Pinker is right, but there's a flaw in his argument. And I tell the story in the book of the, the bet that exposed the flaw. The bet was made by the astrophysicist Martin Rees, who years ago, I think in 2007, made a public bet at something called the Long Now Foundation in San Francisco. He bet publicly that by the end of 2020, bio-error or bio-terror would have cost at least a million deaths. And that was the bet. By the end, by the last day of 2020, an act of bioterror or bioerror would cause at least a million deaths. Or I think they used the word casualties. And Steve Pinker took the bet. Because Steve Pinker said, there's not going to be a pandemic. <laughs> They said Ebola would be a pandemic. They said SARS would be a pandemic. There's not going to be a pandemic because 
progress, because enlightenment. Both the positions are true. That life has got massively better, especially in the last 200 years, and for most of humanity, especially in the last 50 years, but disasters keep happening. And paradoxically, our scientific progress has created new kinds of disaster and in many ways made us more vulnerable to disaster than ever before. So Steve Pinker took the bet and of course lost the bet because of COVID. I was wanting to write a book about disasters and dystopias when COVID began with a little email I got on January the 3rd last year. Something funny about this new pneumonia in Wuhan. Now, if you're a historian, you kind of know that that's not good because so many <laughs> pandemics have begun with a little paragraph that says new form of disease in China. But I'd also been reading a lot of science fiction because I had decided in 2019 that I hadn't been reading enough science fiction. I'd almost overdosed on history. But I was reading science fiction to try and get a better sense of the possibilities of technological change. So oddly enough, I had been reading Margaret Atwood, the Oryx and Crake books, which are about a disastrous man-made pandemic. So it wasn't just the history that was making me nervous in January last year, it was also the science fiction. A lot of science fiction is about pandemics, all the way back to Mary Shelley's book, The Last Man, which is kind of the first ever work of science fiction. So what you get in this book, to be clear, is not a, a, a book about COVID. It is a book about all disasters. And one of the things I try to show in the book is that there is no really meaningful distinction between a man-made or human-made and natural disaster. We, we use these categories, but they are meaningless. And I got this idea from Amartya Sen, the great Indian economist, who said famines are not natural disasters, they are political. And my insight last year was that is true of all disasters, not just famines. Was COVID a natural disaster? You do not need to believe in the lab leak hypothesis uh, to think that it was in large measure man-made. Even if, even if it turned out that there was no lab leak, and the mutation that produced SARS-CoV-2 was natural. Even if that story turned out to be true, which I begin to doubt, it was still man-made in the sense that it was decisions by individuals, by policymakers, by bureaucrats, that determined how many people died in one country as opposed to another. Remember, almost nobody died of COVID in Taiwan and half a million in the United States. It was the same virus. So the politics of catastrophe is one of the central ideas of the book. Another idea that the book tries to explore, which I think is interesting, is the difference between a grey rhino, a black swan, and a dragon king. Now, a grey rhino is uh, Michelle Walker's idea for a, a disaster that you see coming towards you. Like, you see it. You, you can see it not just months off, but years off. Year after year, TED Talks by Larry Brilliant and Bill Gates. A pandemic is a major risk. We need to be very concerned about a pandemic. The grey rhino. Climate change is another. And yet, when it happens, when the disaster strikes, this thing that has been predicted 20 times becomes a black swan. And everybody's amazed. 
and the journalists go on TV and they say, this is absolutely unprecedented. This is out of left field. 2020 was a year like no other. And this is all rubbish because there's nothing more precedented than a pandemic. That is very precedented. So I wanted to try and explain why it is that we can see the gray rhino coming, but we're still surprised when it strikes. Why, just to illustrate the point, in 2019 was the United States said to be the best prepared country for a pandemic in the world, and the UK was second. And yet when the pandemic happened, both countries handled it quite badly. Why? Why was it suddenly a black swan? And then, why do some disasters kill large numbers of people but have no historical consequences? They don't become dragon kings. That is to say, there are some disasters that don't matter historically. Let me give you an example. In 1957, a new strain of influenza swept the world. They called it the Asian flu because it came from, guess where? China. There really was a paragraph in the New York Times that said strange new, strange new form of influenza uh, in Hong Kong. And it killed not quite as large a proportion of the world's population as COVID. COVID is now on 0.06%. And our estimates for the 1957-58 influenza are quite a bit lower than that, about half that. But it's still the pandemic most like COVID. Uh, just to give you an idea, the 1918 influenza was much worse. It was 10 or 20 times worse than COVID in terms of the share of the world's population that it killed. It was about 2%. Even if you accept the highest estimate for COVID, the Asian flu was still 10 times, 10 times worse. And the Black Death, forget it. It killed about a third of all human beings, the bubonic plague. So the interesting thing is that 1957 was very like our experience last year, and yet nobody remembers it. You can talk to people who were alive in 1957, and they don't remember it. How do we explain that, that some historical events have consequences far greater than the body count would lead you to expect, and some have very m many fewer consequences than the body count would lead you to expect? This is an important question that the book tackles. If one asks why it feels as if COVID was a great disaster, it's not really the body count that you're thinking about. What you're really thinking about is all the disruption, particularly the economic and, and social disruption that it caused, and also the second order political effects, like the huge wave of protest that happened last year in the United States, or the fact that Cold War II between the United States and China became so much more obvious in the context of the pandemic. So these are the kind of broad brush strokes that I, that I use to, to, to help you think about disaster. Bringing all the disasters together, including the Titanic. Now, many people have seen the movie <laughs> Titanic. Be, be honest, you yeah. have all seen that movie. Yeah. I think every person in the world saw that movie. But that movie does not tell you the truth about the Titanic disaster and what really happened. And I'm not going to tell you tonight. Oh, this Because if you want to know, you have to buy a book. <laughs> I, I, le I learned an important thing in the last year from my nine-year-old son, Thomas. I was doing a lot of podcasts about the book and interviews and events. And I was feeling a little bit frustrated about the book sales. And I was sitting complaining. Damn it, Michael Lewis is selling more books than me. And I've done all these podcasts. 
my son Thomas, who's nine, said, Dad, have you considered that a podcast might be a substitute for a book rather than an encouragement to <laughs> buy the book? <laughs> of course. So now I don't give it all away. The reason Titanic is interesting is that although it's a relatively small disaster in terms of its death toll, it is extraordinarily impactful culturally. Similarly, the Space Shuttle Challenger is one of these disasters that, I mean, it didn't kill many people, seven people, the crew. But every, every American beyond a certain age remembers that, that event. And I'll tell you one more thing, and then I, I'm going to shut up and we'll have a conversation uh, about that disaster, because it's really important. When the space shuttle blew up, spectacularly, just seconds after its launch, the first response of the Washington press corps, of the media, was to try to blame the president. And the story was that the space shuttle launch had been rushed at the orders of Ronald Reagan because he wanted to mention it in his State of the Union address. Now this was fake news. There had never been any intention to mention it in that speech. So what really happened? I will tell you this. The physicist Richard Feynman discovered that the NASA engineers knew that there was a one in 100, 1% chance that the space shuttle would blow up. They knew that. They knew why too. They knew that the O-rings that kept the fuel from leaking from the launch tanks contracted in cold weather. So that if it was a cold day, the probability was probably even worse than one in a hundred. But in the NASA bureaucracy, there was a little man named Mr. Kingsbury. <laughs> Mr. Kingsbury. And Mr. Kingsbury changed one in a hundred to one in a hundred thousand, mm. which is different. And as I read Feynman's account, I thought, you know, there are a lot of Mr. Kingsbury's in the history of disaster. And just as there's this strong temptation in 1986 to blame Reagan, if you possibly could, last year there was an even more powerful temptation in the United States to blame it all on Trump. It was so satisfying. It's, it solved the problem of why the United States was doing so badly. It was Trump. Jim Fallows wrote a whole essay for The Atlantic saying pilot error was all his fault. Now, I am not saying that Trump made no mistakes. He made so many that you lost count. What I try to show in the book is that, that those mistakes cannot explain the very high levels of mortality in the United States last year. And if you tell yourself as an American, it was all Trump's fault and we got rid of him, therefore the problem is solved, you haven't understood the nature of disaster. Because the nature of disaster is that the point of failure is sometimes quite far down the chain of command. It is Mr. Kingsbury. The things that killed people last year in large numbers were failure to provide adequate tests early on, absence of any system of contact tracing, failure to protect the elderly in elderly care homes, and then any a failure to quarantine potentially infected people. None of those things had anything to do with Donald Trump, nor in Britain were they the fault of Boris Johnson. These were failures of the public health system. CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, utterly failed to provide enough tests. And it would have failed in pretty much the same way if Joe Biden had been president a year earlier. Tolstoy says in War and Peace, the greatest of all novels, that the illusion 
of the time, of the period around 1812, was to think that it was Napoleon and Napoleon alone that made it all happen. This, fo this fallacy that we think the leaders are all important is still very much alive in the Western media and indeed non-Western media today. And Doom says, let's not exonerate bad leaders, but let's recognize that often in a disaster, the point of failure is further down the chain of command. And this is important because the next disaster could very well play out in the same way. Who was Mr. Kingsbury last year? It was a man named Robert Cadleck. Have you heard of Robert Cadleck? Robert Cadleck was the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness at the Department of Health and Human Services. It was his job. And he was therefore the man who oversaw the 36-page pandemic preparedness plan that came out in 2018. But not long after it was published, Robert Cadleck gave a lecture, a talk, at the University of Texas. And a friend of mine, Philip Zellico, found this talk, and he sent it to me. There's a video. And in the talk, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness says, if we don't have a real insurance plan against a pandemic, we're going to be SOL if there is one. Now, I didn't know what SOL meant, because it's an American military acronym, and it's short for shit out of luck. <laughs> We're going to be whistling in the wind a bit, said Cadillac. This was just after they'd published the pandemic preparedness plan. So Doom is about that kind of thing. It asks the question, why, given that we know so much more scientifically than any previous generation, that we can sequence the genetic structure of a virus in a matter of hours and devise highly efficacious vaccines even in days. And yet, somehow, with all our knowledge, we still cannot bring this disease under control. And the answer cannot simply be that some governments are led by incompetent populists. That is not a sufficient explanation. Somewhere, in the Pentagon, there is a 36-page cyber attack preparedness plan. And my guess is that it will be about as good <laughs> as the pandemic preparedness plan when the cyber attack happens. The final insight of the book is that it is better to be generally paranoid, to be open to a whole range of possible disasters than to be meticulously prepared for the wrong disaster. You do not get the disaster that you want. You get the disaster that history, the great ironical God, gives you. So I think one of the reasons that we did badly last year was Mr. Kingsbury and Mr. Cadillac and all the other people whose job it was who did it badly. But there's another reason, and that is, more than in any recent pandemic, more than in 1957, crazy ideas proliferated from the outset about the virus, about treatments, about vaccines. The internet has created, as I argued in my last book, The Square and the Tar, which I think was Plätze und Turme, the internet has created a vast machine for reviving magical thinking. And the revival of magical thinking, the belief that the vaccine will inject a microchip into your bloodstream, which, which half of the people who refuse to be vaccinated believe in the United States, Magical thinking is back. And magical thinking is in some ways more contagious 
than COVID. And you're asking yourself, is there a vaccine? Is there a vaccine for magical thinking? <laughs> and the answer is that there is. <laughs> and it's available here. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you.